You're listening to the Faith and Other Oddities podcast, brought to you by the Raven Creek Social Club, where we talk about faith and other oddities. For questions, comments, or to be part of the conversation, join us on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram, where you can find us at Raven Creek SC. Now for your hosts, Emily Dixon and Nathan Underwood. No, like and it's funny because I I basically just collect random bits and and pieces of information and and I and it's funny because a lot of it you just pick up from talking to people, um, I, I or you know podcast or you know and I basically anymore if there's if there's anything that I want to know about, I'll just look for a podcast on it because you know. I'm, still working up at the school so i get six to eight hours a day listening time oh yeah just under i was like well i was listening to who was i was listening to the other day and they were talking about education and how due to uh the the mobile audio devices and being able to download so much information onto smartphones that um Basically, on, on average, the listening time for people of, of being educated where they would normally be doing repetitive tasks, on average, people like across the board, there's about an average of, I think, like two and a half hours of, of educational time that people are now able to get back in their life that they wouldn't, that they would have been lost doing, like, would have been lost, like, driving or, hmm. um, and, and again, I'm just trying, this is just something I, you know, I didn't take a note of this, but if I remember right, that's basically what it is. You know, it's like either while you're doing a repetitive task or while you're driving. And so there's what's there. They're saying it. We're kind of hopefully um, due to this. Now, of course, you know, this is coming from someone else who has a podcast. Mm -hmm. So I I don't know if I don't know if the numbers are correct. Or um, how biased your source is. Right. I don't. Yeah. Or or if it's possible that um, maybe it's self-aggrandizement. But that, you know, they're like, well, maybe hopefully this will influence the world positively in the fact that we're going back to the menial laborer having a higher education, um, whereas opposed to, you know, because it used to be the, the form of entertainment before television and radio was you'd read. Right. Oftentimes. And oftentimes you'd read the same book several times um, because you didn't have so much access to libraries and things like that. So I, well, I think that's kind of cool. Louis Lamour, you know, when he talks, I think it's an education of a wandering man. And he brings up the idea that, uh, you know, a lot of the cowboys and cowhands, they could only take one book with them. Mm -hmm. And so they would pick a really good book and, you know, Shakespeare or um, trying to think of the others that he was talking about that, and they would, they would, they would read this over and over again. And so they knew it inside out, a law book or something like that, that, that you wouldn't expect a laborer, uh, just a, a common uh, cow hand who, who wasn't considered to be that high in social status would be very well educated, but it was very specifically educated mm -hmm. based on what books he got. But you know, I, well, you're talking, I was thinking, I've got a friend who's a truck driver, and he actually listens to podcast, college lecture podcast, while he drives his truck. Yep. And he's probably better educated without any kind of degrees or certificates than a lot of people who do have degrees, because it's a more well-rounded mm -hmm. education with, that he was able to access. So I, I can see that. And, yeah. Well, and, and, and I got into a discussion one time with the, someone online, they were talking about, uh, you know, education should be free. And I'm like, education's absolutely free. Credentials are not. Right. But, but education, if you want to learn, the, the information's there. And they, you know, they shot back, well, are you, you know, well, are people going to start hiring you based on how many podcasts or YouTube vid videos you've listened to? And it's like, no, but if you want to be educated, that's, that's right. there. and. And, you know, for me, like even just the amount of amount of money I've saved on fixing my car at times, you know, just oh, looking YouTube. up stuff on YouTube has just been incredible. So, so yeah, that's, that's one of the things that I really like, even though I'm, I'm not necessarily having conversations with, uh, 
with customers and things like that all the time, like I used to when I worked in sales. Um, I learned a lot doing mm-hmm. that, but um, at the same time, I, I feel like I, I'm in a really good place education-wise <laughs> for myself. I've I've actually found that I have to consciously decide not to turn it on, not to turn the podcast on, not to listen to one more lecture and just give my brain a break because Mm. you can easily overwhelm yourself. There is so much stuff out there. So, and you and I, we, we are kind of addicted to learning new things. Oh yeah. And so (laughs) I, I realized at one point I've got a redneck hot tub which is old coffee tub with a propane burner underneath. And a lot of times I'll sit out there and soak in the evenings. And I realized this time of relaxation, I was actually listening to some more educational podcast. And I'm like, I've got to stop this. I actually have to like give myself permission and make a conscious decision to stop because yeah. it, it, it's that easy to get a hold of. Yeah, and, it's, it can definitely get that way is if you get used to just having ideas being like fed in but i mean i but i think there are worse things to be hooked on you know well you know you know at least it's not drugs yeah it used to be phonics but no <laughs> um so anyway so wh- when we last left our hero hero a Ab- well we, no we last <laughs> left abraham where was he what was he doing okay uh he had just uh struck a treaty with abimelech and uh they had gone through the debacle of Abraham for the second time, passing Sarah, his wife, off as his sister. Yep. And uh, we were talking about a lot last week about Rosh Hashanah and how we're, we're the Jewish New Year, Genesis 21, this is the chapter to, to read, uh, specifically before 800 uh, CE or AD. Uh, this was the, the passage that was focused on. Uh, when Rosh Hashanah became a two-day celebration, then the binding of Isaac was brought in and was read too. And in reading that uh, over the years, the binding of Isaac has really become, um, it's really become the more prominent or the, the more emphasized text, but that wasn't always the case. Yeah. (laughs) But I just look over and it's like you're hopping. it's, (laughs) It's the chairs. Um, so for our Patreon donors, uh, we appreciate you, but we would hopefully we can we get need. some more so we can buy some new chairs. That's probably our worst piece of equipment right now. Yeah, we need new chairs. Um, but anyway, yeah, sorry. That's, that's another topic for another day. Yeah. So, uh, so we open with, with Genesis 21 and in Genesis 21, it starts out with God remembers, um, it took note of Sarah as he promised and the Lord did for Sarah as he has spoken. And Sarah conceived and bore a son to Abraham in his old age at the set time, which God had spoken. Now what's interesting here again, we have something missing from this text and it, something is not said there, but we always just assume that it happened. Sarah conceives, but there is absolutely no mention like with Hagar, when she has um, conceives Ishmael, it says, in, in Abraham knew Ishmael. I, I, I'm sorry, he knew not Ishmael. Hagar. 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 And she conceived. So there's, there's no mention of any kind of sexual encounter between Sarah and Abraham. Okay. And, and for me, this was very interesting because we're always taught that the idea that God could have a son is kind of like this brand new New Testament ideology that this was something so radical in the person of Jesus that it would have taken people by surprise. Right. And it turns out the teaching is that because there's no mention uh, of any kind of sexual encounter between Abraham and Sarah, that Isaac wasn't seen necessarily as Abraham's son, but was seen as God's son. Hmm. And now I don't, I don't think that that's literal, and I, and I want to be clear on that. But I do think that there, there's some symbolic significance that this would be how Isaac would be perceived. Right. So, and, and but that kind of brings us to the to the thought that the idea of God fathering Jesus wouldn't have been 
unheard of. Wouldn't have been terribly foreign. And that's actually, it's, it's really funny that, and I, I think I've, I've mentioned this before, that Jesus, a lot of the ideas that Jesus brings forth were not revolutionary. Mm-hmm. And they were actually just returning to the root of what the scriptures had already been teaching. And so that's, that's what I find really interesting. You see a lot of, uh, you know, especially as you've been getting, as, as you look into other rabbis that were teaching around the time, was it, um, Hillel? Hillel, yeah. Um, you know, teaching, you know, the, basically the golden rule, you know, that which is, uh, hateful to yourself, don't do it to anyone else. You know, you know, like I said, you know, it, it, it wasn't a new idea that, mm-hmm. you know, that Jesus brought up with the golden rule. Is he, you know, of course, we can always say, well, this is the first time it's stated in a positive light versus a negative light, but I do think it's still... The seeds are there. The foundation is there. Yeah, the is foundation there. is there, and the idea is there, and, the, and that's, we forget about that, and I, I do think whenever, whenever we dismiss the Second Temple literature when we dismiss the Jewish roots and Jewish understanding of scripture, we lose a lot of it. And, and no, and again, you know, we're not saying we should all convert to Judaism. I mean, we haven't, and we don't plan to, because that's not what God's instructed us. But whenever we just forget about the tools that God provided for us in the, in the, uh, in the thinking and the mm-hmm. understanding, mm-hmm. then we really... We just we just lose a lot of it. Well, we do, we do, and we we you know, one of the main things I think we've lost is we've forgotten how to read the text. We right. we've forgotten to look for clues. Like in, in this chapter, when the first three verses, Sarah's name is mentioned five times. Right, and so we we read that, and okay, Sarah, 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 but we don't realize this is really bringing her her front and center to the story, because before this, it's God been talking to Abraham. When Abraham prays, he never mentions Sarah one time, not, not once. When God tells him that Sarah is going to give him a son, Abraham's response is, oh, but, but God, you need to bless Ishmael uh, and take care of Ishmael. Mm-hmm. Uh, there, there's no concern for Sarah up to this point. And now Sarah is, is, is with the pregnancy and the birth of Isaac she kind of steps forward Mm -hmm. and Abraham, whether he likes it or not, is having to look at her beyond just the idea of, of a sister. And he's really being forced to grapple with her identity as a woman, apart from the way he's been viewing her. Mm -hmm. And this is going to change the whole dynamics of the family. And yeah, everything in this story is a mess. I, I don't think you could have a more messed up family dynamic than what's going on here. The slave woman is the, is the wife. The sister is, you know, had a son that he doesn't really care about. It, it's just, it, it's a mess. Mm-hmm. And, you know, this is, I think it's a good thing for us to remember. We could look at whose fault is this? I mean, Sarah invites Hagar in or suggests it to Abraham that they bring Hagar into their marriage. Mm-hmm. Um, Abraham doesn't set his foot down. Hagar mocks Sarah. Ishmael is getting ready to mirror Hagar's um, attitude towards Sarah in his treatment of Isaac. Mm-hmm. And, and, and the story isn't really, it doesn't really care about who's at fault here. It, it doesn't take time to ask that question where I think we as humans probably would. Right. Yeah, that, no, that would make sense. We, it, it's more of a, yeah, it's more, okay, this is the situation we got. We've got to line this out. How are we going to do it? And so uh, Sarah, when she has Isaac, she praises God and says, he has brought me laughter. And everyone who hears will laugh with me is how it's translated in the English. The, the Hebrew actually says, uh, for God has, given, has made a joke for me. Hmm. And they will laugh to me or laugh at me. And now contextually, we know that, that she's saying that they're going to laugh with me. Sure. So I think the translation is correct. But it's very interesting that the literal meaning of her words actually happens pretty quickly because Abraham holds a great feast for Isaac when he's weaned. And this is when Ishmael starts taunting or teasing Isaac. And there's some debate here because the word for taunting or teasing is actually the same word as uh, 
we'll find later when Isaac and Rebecca, uh, Isaac takes a cue from dad and passes Rebecca off as his wife. And Isaac, uh, sorry, he passes Rebecca off as his sister and Abimelech, who had taken Rebecca, uh, sees them playing and realizes that they're married. So playing has more than just a, you know, they aren't playing dominoes. And so there, there's more of a sexual connotation. So there's some debate, too, whether the, the playing that Ishmael was doing with Isaac was sexually inappropriate or if it was just taunting. Hmm. And there's some debate there. And I, I don't think we're ever going to have that one clearly d- yeah. answered. Well, and, and the other thing uh, with taunting and things like that, after he was weaned, you, we should also look at, you know, the age was not like a year and mm-hmm. then you're done. They would, they would breastfeed babies much much older than we do three to five years was nothing unusual yeah and 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 part of that that was birth control sure so that's part of the reason why they do it um so when this happens sarah's like "Uh uh-uh i this kid is not going to inherit with my son Mm -hmm. so you need to kick out the slave woman and the son get rid of him. I don't want him here. And then this is kind of when it gets interesting because this tells you where Abraham's mind is. Is Abraham was greatly concerned for a son of his. It doesn't say which son. It hmm. just says a son. And there's kind of some ambiguity and like some of the Jewish commentators like Rashi, he actually goes out of his way to basically say that Abraham was concerned with for Isaac, but I think that's reaching because if you look at the next uh, verse, it says, but God says to Abraham, don't be distressed over the boy or your slave. Whatever Sarah tells you to do, do what she says. So right. Abraham's not worried about Isaac. He's worried about. Yeah, he's concerned about, about Ishmael getting sent out. Yeah. He, yeah. Cause in his mind, Ishmael's still the heir. He's still the oldest. He's the firstborn. He, he, he's all that Abraham needs for the covenant. Sarah had a kid. That's great. That's her son. It's not Abraham's son. Now, here's an interesting thought, um, because we always hear, and I don't know if you're getting to this, but <laughs> we always hear that, you know, whenever Abraham takes Isaac up on the mountain, the, in, in his mind, he's getting rid of the, his, his heir, mm-hmm. and that you know, at this point, how is God going to make an, a great nation from him? Mm-hmm. Well, we, we talk about how there was a lot of concern for Isaac. And I think in that, at that point in their life that they had developed a strong relationship and that, that Abraham did care for Isaac. But at the same time, do you, is there any speculation that Abraham was thinking of some kind of reconciliation for Ishmael? Yeah, I, well, even, in, and it's interesting you say that, because when he sends Hagar and, and Ishmael out, because God tells him, and we talked about this in the divorce episode, uh, you know, Abraham, he's, God tells him, do what Sarah tells you to do. Mm-hmm. And when he sends him out, okay, this is where we've got to look at two things. Number one, Abraham's not poor. Right. We, we know he's got flocks and camels and servants. Mm-hmm. And what's he send them out with? Some bread and some water. Right. He didn't have to do that. that yeah, that's he, he could have sent a small group with him. Yeah. And he said, hey, make sure she makes it to the next town, set her up in a house, and make sure the boy's taken care of. Right. Yeah. The, the, and the verb there, actually, uh, when he sends them out, is to send out with the idea of retrieval. It, it is actually a verb that has that connotation. So, so there's this idea that he's almost like, you know, here's some bread and here's some water, be gone for the afternoon, come back. Because what happened the last time when Hagar left? An angel sends her back. And that's chapter 16. Sarah gets mad at her, Hagar runs off, an angel sends her back. So I think even at the very beginning, at the outset of this, he was really looking at he was going to get Ishmael back. Yeah. Sarah's going to calm down. We'll bring him back later. No, mm-hmm. no big deal. Mm-hmm. And th- there's no, there's no sense of finality w- with, uh, with what Hagar and Ishmael is doing, at least in, in Abraham's mind. But in some ways, I think at this point, sending Ishmael away 
was a lot more difficult than the idea of losing Isaac. Hmm. I, at least, like I said, at this point, because at this point, Isaac is, you know, three to five years old. And Ishmael is about 13 or so. And so if it, Ishmael's 13, then he's past the point of the high mortality rate because it was around, you know, it wasn't until about six years old that you really considered your child was, hey, they're going to make it. Yeah. And what was it? In some cultures, they didn't even consider children to be people because the mortality rate was so high mm-hmm. that until they made it past a certain age, forget it. It, it just wasn't going to happen. Um, and so, you know, even with the even with the lower mortality rate among children, you know, there are times when I I understand why you wouldn't want to consider someone a full human until they were, you know, six or seven. But, you know, <laughs> and that depends on the day, of course. But, you know. <laughs> <laughs> there's some, day, there's was, some people at 30 i don't consider fully human but that's was, a, i was talking i was talking to one of uh i was talking to one of the teachers up at school and uh i think i've mentioned her before but she's from she's from england and i was talking about how the, the kindergartners are you know just insane she's like and she goes yes almost feral <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, that's a good way to put it. Uh, put it on some days, but they, I mean, they they just you know they haven't quite grasped all the social rules that you know. Of course, I could say that about some older kids I know too. So there, there are some times I wonder if I grasp all the social rules, but uh, yeah. And what's what's funny about this story is in, in trying to keep Ishmael. Abraham almost kills him. Right. He, he like, the, the exact opposite of what he's trying to accomplish is pretty much what almost happens here. Mm-hmm. And so I, I want to pull out a few things in, in the, the, that go on. Uh, Hagar, because you actually sent me down a whole path with a question you ask. Oh, um, yeah. <laughs> and so, because uh, you brought up the idea that, uh, well, you, you say it and. Okay. So yeah, it was, and was this in our divorce episode? Did I ask it in the divorce episode no, or was it just another this is one? a phone conversation? Okay. I couldn't remember. It's been a while since we did that mm-hmm. episode, but the, um, so when we, when we read the, the parallel between Isaac and Hagar, um, whenever, uh, they're in the desert and Hagar thinks that, that Ishmael's going to die of thirst. She, she tells God, do what you will, just don't make me watch my son die. And then you, you, can, you contrast that with Abraham and God saying, uh, you're going to take Isaac up on the hill and you're going to kill him. I mean, that, that's gonna see it. quite a juxtaposition mm-hmm. of the two narratives from, uh, uh, you know, from the parents that care for their children and, and what's happening there. And so I was wondering just, uh, just if there's anything to that, and I probably should have done a little more research on my own. Um, but I've been editing like mad since the last, uh, yeah, <laughs> since. Well, I, I actually took that question and, and I, I kind of ran with it because the, there is some interesting things and, and she does, she sits down, the text is very clear that, um, she sits down opposite from him, away from him, about a bow shot away. And so that's about 300 feet or so it is what it winds up being. And then, then when you move on further in the text, let's see, that is verse, um, uh, to do, I lost it. Babo shot, that's verse 16. So that's verse, verse 16. If you come over to verse 20, the very last phrase in verse 20, have you got it there? And it talks about what Ishmael became. Oh, that's kind of interesting. You just you go ahead and read it. Yeah. He, um, God was with the boy and he grew up and dwelt in the wilderness and became a bowman or an archer is what. Right. And, and so bow shot, bowman. So this, there's a tip off here that, that this is this particular passage is set up in. Uh, a chiastic form that this is a, a, a beginning to to see that there might be something in how this is written 
and in the structure of how it's written, that can actually reveal more about what the message is. Mm-hmm. And so this is just, to me, this was just fascinating. I, I'd heard about chiastic forms before. Um, I hadn't really studied them. And those, and that's the form, it's where there's kind of a a build on one side. If you'd imagine like like a suspension bridge with one peak you know you have you kind of have a build up to the pinnacle and then you go back down but they mirror each other if that makes sense yeah the first and the last points of a story connect and then the next the second and the next the last and then the third and the you know Mm -hmm. and you just keep going up until you get to the center and when you get to the center that is the the most important idea that's being explored that's the um that's going to be the highlighted passage that's either going to be the passage that is uh, has the most to teach us, or it's going to be the passage where things turn around. And right. it's the center axis is what it's called. And um, this is, a lot of times that center axis is where we see the reversals start to come in. And when I started looking into this and actually just started looking up, uh, just Googling chiastic structures and the Bible, mm-hmm. it's everywhere. Oh, yeah, yeah. It's, it's everywhere. I knew it. there were certain places. Um, I thought to kind of illustrate this, we would use like Noah, because uh, this is a story everybody knows. Sure. And um, so I'd look at, I thought we'd look at Noah real quick and then um, go into how this is used with Hagar and Ishmael. But uh, you got to look for your clues to see where they are. And, and the good news is there are people who have already done this. So you can right. actually find this on the Internet if you want to. But like Noah, uh, 610, Genesis 610, it has the phrase Noah and his sons. Genesis 9, 18, verse 18 and 19a, Noah and his sons. Uh, all the life on earth is mentioned in 6, 13. In verses 9 and 10, uh, chapter 9, verse 10, all the life on earth. And it's repeated. Um, now, in, in the chiastic forms, sometimes it isn't always a perfect mirror image. It's not like exact. Sometimes it's um, that reversal. Yeah. So... In Genesis 6, 13b, God curses the earth, but mm-hmm. in 9, 12, and 17, he blesses the earth. Okay. So that's how that kind of works. And then you get the flood, you know, the flood announced is going to be in the future. And then you get the flood. There's promise there's no flood in the future. And, and the center of all of this, uh, you know, the water rises and the water recedes, but right in the middle, God remembers Noah. Sure. So that's where the reversal comes in. That's when everything goes from you know, we went from order to chaos and then we're going back to chaos to order. So you can see that nice parallel structure where things are inverted. Yeah. And uh, there's even inside of that, there's a, a mini chiastic uh, form, which I thought was interesting because um, the verses mirror each other with seven days. Uh, there's two sets of seven days mm-hmm. and then there's a set of 40 days. Yeah. And then there's a set of um, 150 days. Uh, on verses in right in the middle again, God remembers Noah. Right. So sometimes it can be very pointed and very easy to see. And um, that's, re- and that's the reason why I wanted to talk about it with the flood was just, it's like, you can see it with that. I, I think most people can even don't ha- have to have the passage in front of them. They can kind of envision that. Sure. So um, the bow shot becomes, or the, uh, the bow shot and the archer, become the the kicking kickoff points for finding the chiastic form that center axis for uh hagar and ishmael okay so uh genesis 21 16 she says let me not look at the death of the child and in genesis 21 19 if you look at the verse there god tells her uh, the lord opens her eyes and she sees the well so you see how the, that theme of sight is mirrored in both those verses. Mm-hmm. Uh, Genesis 21, 16, C, and she lifted up her voice and, and wept. And in Genesis 21, 18, God says, lift up the boy. In Genesis 21, 17, God uh, heard the voice of the boy. And in Genesis 21, yeah, 21, 17, C, I say, 17a, God hears the voice of the, uh, voice of the boy. 
17 C, he says, fear not for God has heard the voice of the boy. And so we're narrowing down and right at the center of that chiastic structure is, and the angel of the Lord called out to Hagar. Hmm. And that's where things changed uh, for, for both of them. And so this, this becomes, it becomes the turning point, both of the story itself, but it also is going to influence how we read the Akeda. Uh, and before we move to the Akeda, which I think is very... Um, and Akeda, for those who did, didn't hear that term this episode, it's uh, the binding of Isaac mm-hmm. and uh, what we call, what we often call the sacrifice of Isaac in America. Mm-hmm. Um, but binding is more appropriate because we he wasn't actually sacrificed. Right. But I, before we get there, one of the things I wanted to point out, you know, it's very interesting that Ishmael becomes a bowman when his his mother was separated by... A bow shot, yeah. Mm-hmm. And so there's two things going on here. And they can be happening simultaneously. It's a both and, not an either or. Okay. And this is very common with people who have a kind of estranged or to, um, a relationship with their parent that's kind of marked by doubt and animosity. There's this de- desire to both bridge that gap, mm-hmm. and then there's this desire to hurt and to injure. And so it, it's that I love my parent who's not here. How do I get closer to them? They hurt me, and I need to hurt them back. So it, it, it's there's kind of that that kind of tension, the kind of representation of the of the bow shot being that 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 was the that was the pain that she had abandoned him, but then that same language is used to talk about what he goes grows to embrace. Is that kind of what you're talking mm-hmm. about? Yeah. He, he, he kind of, he, he, he begins to get the tools to, to both to address that pain and that, that pain begins to, to kind of form who he is. And if you, but if you look at the, what the angel tells Hagar, um, he tells her, he says, um, sorry, this is kind of, um, Come, lift the boy up, hold him by the hand, and I will make a great nation of him. You know, basically, you need to be active. You need to be guiding this child. You need to be participating in this child's life because he's going to be a great nation. He needs good parenting if he's going to father these a nation. And, and you know, when Abraham, right after this, he's going to, he's going to make a um, a treaty with Abimelech. Mm-hmm. And part of the treaty is that Abraham and his sons would treat Abimelech well. Right. And, and why does he need to be treated well? Why does he worry about Abraham and his sons? I mean, Isaac is just a little guy. And, but Ishmael, he's a warrior. He, a bow was like the most advanced technology and weaponry of this day. Right. So Abimelech's like seeing Ishmael as somebody to be feared. Okay. So I, I, and that kind of doesn't have a whole lot to do with what's going on, but it kind of gives you a little insight into, uh, into who Ishmael was. And so anyway, yeah, cause he says, as a matter of fact, that's right after, I mean, like immediately, uh, Ishmael becomes a bowman in verse 20. Verse 22, at that time, Abimelech and Pichol, the chief of his troops, said to Abraham, God is with you in everything you do. Therefore, swear by me, swear to me here by God that you will do, not deal falsely with me and worth my kith and kin, but deal with me in the land with all, all <laughs> the land in which you have sojourned as loyally. Sorry, I've got a post-it note in my way. Dropping my notes. As loyally as I have dealt with you. And Abraham says, I swear it. So, um, there, Ishmael obviously has presented enough of a threat to Abraham, uh, I'm sorry, to Abimelech, at least the perception of a threat mm-hmm. that something has to be done. So that's, that's where the, um, the expulsion of, of Ishmael begins. Right. And, and that's kind of the big thing. So as we move into the Akeda, uh, we want to keep that in mind. Keep it. Keep those points in mind. Uh, how that that 
that structure was lined out, that it was uh, the bow, the not looking, that she lifted her voice and that God heard the voice of the boy and that um, the central point is when the angel of the Lord calls out. Okay. That's going to be, be the central point. Sorry. Yeah, the central points. Okay. That was repetitive and redundant. What do you got there? These are my notes. Oh, they fell down. Okay. So, <laughs> for those of you not watching. Yeah, I, I drop things. Hey, guy, New Raven. Yeah, that's uh, kind of funny. I'm like, get, taking notes like my daughter does. <laughs> like, <laughs> I drew a picture. These are my notes. <laughs> so. Well, a lot of times my notes and my pictures are the same thing. So, you kind of have to <laughs> sift through to find both of them. That's funny. So, so then, uh, so then after that, we move on to the, the sacrifice of Isaac. Mm-hmm. Um, for those of you not familiar with the story, that's where, uh, Abraham has, uh, cast out Ishmael. He's not coming back. Um, not this time. Then God tells Abraham, you know, it's time for you to take your son, uh, bind him on an altar and sacrifice him. Mm -hmm. I mean, which is weird. So, (laughs) I mean, I, and and now this is, I don't know if you're going to get to this point, but this is actually one of the stories, you know, of course we all know the sacrifice, uh, as Abraham's getting ready to, to sacrifice Isaac, the angel stops him and says, nope, uh, we're going to, we're going to use this goat instead. Um, and so this is actually one of, one of the criticisms of, of, that we get as Christians is again, you know, we, we get, we're told, oh, well, you're, you're, your religion's based on the beliefs of a crazy old man who tried to kill his own son. <laughs> yeah. Um, and this is actually one of the, one of the messages that, like the rabbinic teachers get out of it is that this isn't, uh, this isn't a pro child sacrifice message. This is actually, uh, Yahweh stepping in and saying, no, we don't actually kill our kids here. Um, mm-hmm. that's not what we're doing because there are plenty of cultures who did practice child sacrifice, mm-hmm. but this is one of those areas where God steps into history and says, no, we're doing it a different way. Yeah. And that's pretty cool. So that's, that's one of my favorite parts of this, but I'm sure you have a lot more to, <laughs> to add to it. Uh, well, and believe it or not, that is only, uh, that particular message is only a small part of what the sages and the rabbis got out of this. Mm-hmm. Uh, I, I think where we are in a culture where sometimes we're having to push back and go, that's not what the Bible means. We kind of grab hold, hold of those points like that, that seem to, to mean a lot. Um, but the, the Jewish commentators had a hard time with this passage too, because it, it's disturbing. It, yeah. it runs counter to everything. And matter of fact, Rashi builds on a, a commentary, a very sheet Rabbah, um, Genesis Rabbah. It's a, it's a commentary on Genesis. Okay. And so basically they go back in and they, they write in the missing parts of the Bible. And so they fill in with speculation. Okay. And so it's one of the Midrashim. Yes. And it, it's, it, it, it's very good because it gives you some idea of what they're willing to do to kind of work through these quote unquote contradictions or flaws in God's character. And, um, and so one of the, the theories put forward, and I found this to be very interesting, is this idea that basically Satan goes to God and says, hey, Abraham like gives his sons all this food whenever they, they get together, and, and he's always feeding them well, but I don't see him giving any food to you. There's no sacrifice or offering to you, God, so he must not love you that much. And God says, if I ask him for the child, he'll give me the child. Right. So... You know, obviously, this is based on Job one and two. Yeah, no, that, and that's interesting. I, that's something I hadn't actually considered before. Uh, we were talking about he he gives all this to the sons, but none to you, because we we think about it. We don't have much in the way of Abraham's religious practice. Mm-hmm. We have a lot about his relationship to God and the conversations that he has with God. But as far as religious practice, there's almost nothing uh, mentioned. We've got him building some altars, and mm-hmm. it's very interesting that when he builds an altar, a lot of times there's no mention of a sacrifice. He right. just builds an altar. Just builds an altar, yeah. 
and, and but yeah, you're right. Beyond that, I but you know, Judaism is formalized at this point. So well, yeah, well, I, I yeah, I realize that, but I just it mm-hmm. just strikes me as interesting that there's not much about the spe- the specific uh, acts that he does when, like I said, when he builds the altars, or there's nothing about his daily practice. There's no, there's no. <laughs> He had his quiet time, you know, there's just none of that, you know? Yeah. It, and, and actually like, uh, one of the most significant acts of worship that Abraham practices is his hospitality. Sure. And, and so that, that's about it whenever it comes down to how, how does he worship? And, and to kind of give you an idea of where, how far we aren't going with this, uh, I could have easily built, like, we could have been talking about this for the next seven weeks. Right. But Genesis 21 is actually parallel to Genesis 12. And this is important because Genesis 12 is the first time God speaks to Abraham. Mm-hmm. If you read the story closely, you know that Genesis 21 is the last time God speaks to Abraham. Right. Because immediately after that's pretty much his funeral. Pretty much. Well, well he, I mean, about, there's, there's the funeral of Sarah. Yeah. And then, and then there's, yeah, then... Not not long after that, in the text is you know he, his death, and then Isaac carrying on. Yeah, but um, yeah, and then you have twelve and twenty one. You know, you got your reverse. <laughs> reverse sorry, yeah. I'm I'm kidding. <laughs> um, but but no, uh, yeah, and there is a lot of information. Uh, she's talked to me about quite a bit of it, and so we, if you can survive the chiastic stuff, uh, we'll. <laughs> uh, yeah, <laughs> that's I... uh, it was just kind of funny because I was listening to uh, I was listening to Naked Bible and David Burnett was talking about a ver- uh, chapter he was taking apart and he's like it's like I didn't want to do the chiastic thing cuz everyone's onto that these <laughs> days and it and it's so often it's so dry um so you know we realize it's it's a little technical on what we're doing this week but there's a reason for it yeah and i think when you see why that this i think that's what's going to make it very interesting once you see how it does fit together so in genesis 12 and uh, and 22 i actually this is really this is good uh, God tells Abraham where to go. In this chapter, God shows him where to go. Um, he's supposed to leave and take in both chapters. He's supposed to leave his his past behind. Uh, in Genesis 12 and Genesis 22, he's supposed to take Isaac, his quote-unquote future. future yeah. And so um, both are a search for, for sacred space. And this is going to become very important because God is going to show him the hamakom, uh, the place, and it's literally what that means. Uh, and whenever you see the place in the scripture, there's there's an element of um, mystery and mm-hmm. sacredness about it. And so, uh, it, it's funny some of the names. Like the name is the place. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, the the place. God's name, uh, I am. <laughs> yeah, <it's, laughs> this is this is it. You know, uh, well, Noah names Shem Shem, Shem. <laughs> which is name. I was like. <laughs> Okay, you need a name. Name. Yeah. Uh, yeah. It's, but, uh, yeah. it's not even like dog. I mean, it's not like calling your dog dog. This is worse. No, a, there was a lady I went to church with for a while that uh, her youngest son was named Quint um, because they couldn't think of any names and he was number five. Okay. <laughs> there you go. It means five. Five. Yeah. So. <laughs> okay. So, yeah, and then the, the, the final piece in this is in Genesis 12, God commands and um, God blesses and then gives Abraham a, a command. It's like, here's the carrot. Now will you do it? Right. In 22, God doesn't give any information. It's the command. Abraham does it, and then he's blessed. Hmm. And so um, I'm sure you could probably do some chiastic work and see put that into a structure there, too. Sure. Uh, I'm not going to do it because uh, you know, Burnett's right. It, it's boring um, until you see it. So when the story opens up, God is, has told Abraham, hey, you know, get up, take your son Isaac. Um, it, but when he's the first thing he says is God says, Abraham, Abraham says, Hanani or here I am, which Hanani is not just here I am or I am here. It's. I am fully present and I am committed to do what you tell me. I mean, hmm. it, it is this idea. I have agreed to whatever you're going to propose before you say it. Who uh, heard, <laughs> understood and acknowledged. Yeah, yeah. E- like, exactly. <laughs> yeah. Well, and e- even if I haven't heard you yet, I'm going to, I'm still going to act. Yeah. So 
uh, he, he opens this up with Hanani, and it's very interesting because you gotta remember, this is the guy who uh, he fights for Sodom, or, or he at least pleads Sodom's case. Negotiates for him. And he, he negotiates for them. Poorly, too. He didn't get the city. He didn't get the city. Sorry. But he did fight for them with the Battle of the Four Kings. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, with Ishmael, when uh, God sent him away, he was at least grieved over it. Mm-hmm. Um, he, he tries to manipulate and actually play God and almost winds up killing Ishmael. Um, he, he doesn't do any of that for Isaac. That is interesting. Yeah. He, he, the, there's no resistance. That's, that's at least. Yeah. I mean, surely there had to be some kind of reluctance, but yeah, like you said, it, yeah, it's not in the text. It, it, it's not. And, and what's interesting, the other thing that goes on in God tells Abraham, take the son. And, and there's a, there's a, uh, a midrash and Abraham says, you know, which son? I've got two sons. And God says, take the one that you love. And he goes, but, well, I love them both. And he goes, take Isaac. <laughs> and so it, it, it's, it, there's this, you know, they, they picked up on this, that, that he wasn't quite getting it. But this is the first time we have... It's like having a conversation with the child. <laughs> I'm sorry. That, that's, just go ahead. I'm, I'm, I'm not going to articulate any more of that today. <laughs> well, it, it, he, he is the child. But this is interesting in that it's the first time we have the word love used in all of the Bible. It, it's never mentioned before this. Hmm. And you would think with all of the marriages, all of the seductions, all of the that love would have come up at some point. Right. So it, it doesn't. That, <laughs> yeah. And it, that's really weird, especially when you consider what a central theme that is, that love becomes throughout the whole Bible. And, and then, and then in turn though, you know, Western literature, uh, you know? Yeah. Uh, well, you know, we, we actually. Well, I realize this is Eastern literature, but you know what I'm saying? The, 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 a lot of Western literature is influenced by the Bible. Well, it, we, for us, I mean, love has become like the, the end all be all of our society. We don't define what love is, but we, we act like it is the most important thing as long as it is defined according to our, our gut <laughs> kind of feeling. Yeah, that's so. a whole, yeah, we, we, we spiral out of control on, on what, what is love. Baby, don't. Nope. Uh, oh. Stop it. <laughs> <laughs> so, I, <laughs> don't do that to me. <laughs> Come into my house. <laughs> Eat your food. <laughs> okay, so Abraham takes Isaac, and they go on their they they go three days. Which okay, three. Three days. That's important. Three days on foot. On foot. And they go to Moriah. And uh, he tells the servants when they get to the, to the mountain, he's like, yeah, guys, wait here with the donkey, which is kind of an interesting little point because there's not a lot of times that the livestock is mentioned when right. they're traveling. Uh, you just kind of take it for granted. And uh, he takes Isaac up the, up the hill and as they're... They're going up the hill. Isaac is carrying the firewood. Well, when you carry firewood, you bind it. Right. So we have bound wood on boy. Mm -hmm. And at the end of the story, we're going to have a bound boy on wood. Right. So again, we're seeing that tip off that there's going to be this chiastic structure going on again. And as they're going up the hill, Isaac, for the first time, calls Abraham father Mm -hmm. and abraham says to him um yes my son he says hanani actually in the hebrew hanani my son and Hmm. so here i am i I, i'm i'm with you i'm present in this moment i and i'm going to do what needs to be done and this is the first time that he's acknowledged isaac as his son right It, it has never happened before and um Isaac says, you know, I see the wood, I see the fire. Where's the... <laughs> <laughs> no, no, hang on a minute. Something's wrong. We're missing something. We're, uh, <laughs> items on the list. <laughs> yeah. yeah, and, and Wood. The, and the fire. question... <laughs> Starts looking around. 
<laughs> Sorry. <laughs> Dad. Uh, so, yeah, he, but the question is, in ancient Hebrew or in the Hebrew, there, there's, there's no punctuation. Mm-hmm. So when Abraham answers him, he says, here's the, um, he says, uh, God will see to the sheep for his burnt offering, comma, my son. Or is it, God will see the sheep for his burnt offering, my son. Well, that that's definitely... <laughs> you know, where the inflection is... Right, right. You know, and that, that's an impo- that would be a very important comma. It, like, it, yeah, his whole <laughs> life literally hangs on that comma. <laughs> <laughs> Let's eat, Grandma. Let's eat, Grandma. Yeah. Um, two different sentences. Yeah. And so, so there's, there's some debate there. How was that said? Because the text doesn't preserve it. The, there's no punctuation in the mm-hmm. Hebrew, so we don't know. Now, we could look at something called canticles, which is, uh, tells us how a text would be sung. Sure. Because you don't just, if you're reading in Hebrew, you don't just read it. You actually, you do this, cant, uh, you know, this cantor, you, 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 you sing you it. You sing it because yeah. music is a great tool for education, and that's how people could memorize the mm-hmm. Bible. Um, that's. And we'll, we'll talk more about that eventually, about music and education. I, I, I'm working uh-huh. on some shows for that. So yeah. we'll do that at some point. Uh, and so they, you know, they, get up the, they get up the hill. Um, they, Abraham lays the wood on the altar. He sets Isaac, he binds Isaac um, and puts him on the altar. He sends out his hand, which is the same word. Uh, for sent when he sent Ishmael out, it's this is the same word there. Mm-hmm. Um, sends out his hand, and the angel of the Lord stops him. Now, there's some things that we need to ask here. Um, how old was Isaac? Right, because I, you know, we're usually shown in church or what have you. Isaac's what seven, eight, maybe nine. Yeah, and Abraham's at this point he's well over a hundred years old, mm-hmm. and um. There is some teaching that he could have been as old as 37. There's some that he could have been even 33, which has some interesting implications right there. Fair, yeah. Uh, if he was anything b- above, what, 10, 11, uh, with a father that's over well over 100 years old. Yeah, especially in the society where they're at, where you have to work really hard, and so you're you know, actually strong and capable. Yeah. Yeah. He, if he wasn't just a child, he had to get on that, allow himself to be bound and get on that altar mm-hmm. himself. And so the, there's some debate. How old was he? And I, there's no, I've read arguments both ways. I don't think there's any clear cut. Uh, this is the answer. Mm-hmm. But it does make you ask some questions. And so um, the angel of the Lord comes, says, don't touch the child. And Abraham, quote, sees the ram behind him. And I I say, quote, sees, because you can't see what's behind you. Right. So that's another question that has to be explored. How does Abraham see what is behind him? Well, now, is this, uh, okay, so we could take it, is it? Maybe he just became aware of it. Did it make a noise? But why didn't they say here? But is this is this also sees the Ramah? Is it seeing what God has provided up until this point? Is that the point they're trying to make? Um, it, is the Ram symbolizing how far they've come? Uh, the, these are questions I'm I'm actually asking, but because uh, I don't know, these aren't recorded. I have no idea. Like, well, I, I this is where it comes in. That, well, we're, we're actually, we'll, we'll get back to that. We will answer a lot of that uh, okay. pretty, whenever we get back uh, to uh, how the, the Hagar and Ishmael story play off of this and why the, the two have to be read together. Okay. And because um, it becomes, it, it does become very apparent. Okay. And um, so this, this story it has a lot of little interesting details that once you start to pull them out, you begin to to see that there's more than just the possible killing of a child here, right? And um, 
so one of the other things too that, that's happening here is you know Abraham calls Isaac his son. Mm-hmm. This is the first time he's called him his son. Matter of fact, this is the first time Abraham has spoken to Isaac uh, up until this in point, the text. In the text, yeah. <laughs> I, I'm sure he yelled at him a few times because that's what you do. You I mean, can't stop. If you're a parent, no. <laughs> <laughs> you know. Like you do. Like you do. Yeah. Um, what's, uh, so, but, but hold on. Before we move on, you asked a question. Uh, Are you getting to that answer? Or uh, we're 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 going to get there. Okay, we're going to get there. It's a right. teaser. I want to make sure. Well, are we getting there today? I don't think we're going to get there today. About seeing behind. About seeing behind. Okay. So something so, to think about. All right. Uh, Drive you crazy. Yep. <laughs> but uh, yeah, so so let's go. Uh, let's go on with what you're saying. I just I wanted to make sure we didn't miss that point because I mm-hmm. asked a whole bunch of questions while you were in the middle of it. So I didn't want to like. Well, I didn't want to lose it uh, if, you, if I was interrupting. All of that's going to to be brought out, and this is the reason why. You know, there are all these questions that if you really read the text, um, closely. And use your imagine, use your imagination to actually picture walking through the text. Mm-hmm. That you realize how many gaps there are in the description, or things that are just not said. And then when we go back and we we put it in this chiast, chiastic, I always want to like swap the A and the I, the chiastic um, structure. Then, then the important part comes out. But then also, whenever you play it off of the Hagar and Ishmael story. You see how what is highlighted in Hagar and Ishmael actually leaps out of the page with the binding of Isaac. Hmm. And it answers these questions that that otherwise the text seems to neglect. Right. And so I I I, I think to go into that, uh, we wind up going way over time, keep everybody here, you know, for two hours. Don't want to do that. Uh, so I just want to point out real quick uh, a couple of interesting things number one this place it where this happened is disputed okay and there's two possible locations for where this could have went down uh one is the wheat field that uh sorry not wheat field the threshing ground that david bought for the temple okay so it'd be temple mound and we would know where that is today that's we got that location this, which, which the the symbolism and tradition of that would be pretty obvious, right? Because this is where the sacrifices take mm-hmm. place. This is uh, and where you engage, and the Temple Mount is Hamakon. Again, okay. the same word being used. Um, and and for millennia, this was accepted. This was part of Jewish tradition. This is what they believed, and this was just how it was. Okay. Um, Christians came along and they said, mm, "We think you might have it wrong. We think he actually went." past Jerusalem. He went a little further north and there's another hill up there that's a little taller and it's called Golgotha. Okay. And so from that point on, the early Christian church said this is where Abraham offered Isaac. And the Jews are uh, saying that it's definitely at the temple. So this is this is a very disputed thing. But there's not any significant uh, geographical markers in the text, though, is there? We know it's Moriah, which Moriah is actually, it's not just a simple mountain. It is a mountain chain. Okay. So um, we know it was one of the, the tall hills. Well, there's more than one. Right. Uh, the, the big question is, how do you f- define Hamakom? Is Hamakom really one specific place where God actually manifests himself Mm -hmm. or is it any place that God manifests himself? So this becomes a major point of, of theology about God's sovereignty and uh, geography and dominion. Mm. And all of these questions become wrapped up in this one little story with Isaac and, you know, to, to be able to, to, to look at that deeper, we're going to have to, we'll have to return to this again next week and yeah. look at, um, we'll look at two things. We'll look at the chiastic structure, structure and we'll look at Hagar and Ishmael, um, how these two play together. And if we got time, we'll look about how this plays as a type. 
Sure. So uh, lots of good information. And like I said, I, I, when I opened this up with Genesis 12, going back to that chapter, mm-hmm. that was just to give you an idea of all the stuff I'm not telling you. Because right. you can actually, just a quick teaser, you can tie this back to Noah and the vineyard. Yeah. So uh, we'll, we'll we'll look into that and in no, we this, aren't. Well, I'm saying I'm saying <laughs> we, you and I may, but if if uh, if y'all want to know about it, we'll put links to some stuff in the show notes if we can find anything. Because um, I know a lot of your stuff is coming out of commentaries. I don't know how much of it's coming from online sources. But. A lot of commentaries, and and some of it it gets so technical. Like I would never take a podcast audience through knowing the vineyard and this connection. I'm telling you, it's there. But I'm not going to take an audience there because it's so technically Hebrew. Sure. And so, you know, there's some things, I'm sorry, guys, the Hebrew just unlocks it for you. And I can't get you there unless you've got it. But that's just to give you an idea of how rich and full this text is. And it's not just this, t- this text. Yeah. It, it's the whole entire Bible. So. Okay. Well, cool. Well, that sounds like we need to wrap up there this week. And then we will uh, pick up next week. Uh, Again with the binding of Isaac. Again with the binding of Isaac. Um, so, <laughs> sorry. so we'll, we'll hit that next week. I don't know, just the way I said it. All right, we again with it. Um, like having a Seinfeld moment over here. Uh, yeah. I don't know. <laughs> so we'll hit that up next week. Thank you so much for tuning in and listening to our insanity. Um, we hope you're enjoying it. If you do, please uh, subscribe, uh, share, comment. Uh, let us know you're out there. Be part of the conversation. Raven Creek SC on all the social media, ravencreeksc.com for the website. Uh, Patreon, Raven Creek SC. Um, if you really, really like it, you know, maybe give us, uh, give us some support and let us know you want the show to keep going. And because uh, the more support we get there, the longer this show is going to go. So thank you again for tuning in. We're, I, I'm excited about next week. Seems like we're really. Or, I mean, because this was pretty interesting, even like just se- kind of setting, <laughs> yeah, just kind of setting the stage, and 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 it's still pretty interesting. It's kind of like if you ever read Lawhead, uh, you know, he's he wrote he wrote a King Arthur series, and Arthur doesn't isn't even born until like the very end of the second of the five books. Yeah. So anyway, <laughs> but but that's kind of where I feel like we are tonight or today. <laughs> I don't know what day. Whenever you're listening, so anyway. We'll see you next week. We're glad you're here. Thanks so good. Y'all have a great week. Bye. Bye. You've been listening to the Faith and Other Oddities podcast, a Raven Creek Social Club production. Don't forget to follow us on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram. If you like what you've heard, please write us a review on iTunes or consider supporting us on patreon.com slash ravencreeksc. As always, thank you for listening and don't forget to join us next week.